Good morning and welcome to worship on this first Sunday of the new Methodist Connectional Year. So as we prepare ourselves, let us pray. Faithful God, as some of us begin to meet together in our church buildings and many continue to gather in our homes to worship you, help us to praise with the joy of a new beginning to refresh in us a sense of mission to our neighbours and to thank you for all that you continue to do in our lives. Amen. Good morning everyone, it is time for the prayer of adoration. We thank you and bless your name, Lord God, creator of all. To you be glory and praise forever. You founded the heavens and earth. 
in the beginning to work the work of your hands in the fullness of time you made us humans in your image to praise you adore you and live our lives to be pleasing you as your children we thank you for the gift of life today we pray accept O oh lord our thanks and praise for all that you've done for us your presence is always with us from the moment we wake up to face the day and as we go to sleep at the end of the day you are always with us every day we will praise you god amen Good morning, church, and now we've reached the time for Thanksgiving prayers. We thank you, Father God, Lord Jesus, and the Holy Spirit for this gathering today to hear you speak your word of hope and truth to us. We thank you for the blessing of family and friends and for your loving care which surrounds us on every side. We thank you, God, for your Son, Jesus Christ, for the truth of his word, the example of his life, and the greater sacrifice of death on the cross to take away our sins. We thank you for protecting us from many dangers like the coronavirus pandemic raging the world and be with all those working hard to develop a vaccine. We thank you as children have restarted schools and thank you also as others and myself start university or apprenticeships in the coming weeks. As a family, we pray and thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for your healing grace in our dad Arnold's life and for giving him another year as it is his birthday today. Lord, may you continue to bless us all, meeting us at our point of need. May the Lord bless and protect us. May the Lord smile and be gracious to us, showing us his favour and give us his peace now and forevermore. Amen. A prayer of confession. Lord, you call us to love our neighbour as ourselves, to testify to the reality of our faith through the love we show to others. Forgive us our failure to live up to your calling. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Forgive us for those times when we have ignored those in need. Too busy with our own affairs, too concerned with our own pleasures, too protective of our own interests. All the ways we have denied you through our failure to act. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Cleanse and renew us through your grace and restore us through your love so that we may learn to love others with the love you have so faithfully shown us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the name of Christ. Amen. And so we say together the Lord's Prayer. 
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Love fulfills the law. The reading this morning is from Romans 13, verses 8 to 10. Pay everything you owe, but you can never pay back all the love you owe one another. Whoever loves other people has done everything the law requires. Here are some commandments to think about. Do not commit adultery. Do not commit murder. Do not steal. Do not want what belongs to others. These and all other commandments are included in one command. And here's what it is. Love your neighbour as you love yourself. Love does not harm its neighbour, so love does everything the law requires. Thanks be to God. The reading is taken from Luke chapter 10 verses 29 to 37. The parable of the Good Samaritan. But the man wanted to make himself look good, so he asked Jesus, who is my neighbour? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Robbers attacked him. They stripped off his clothes and beat him. Then they went away leaving him almost dead. A priest happened to be going down that same road. When he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. A Levite also came by. When he saw the man, he passed by on the other side too. But a Samaritan came to the place where the man was. When he saw the man, he felt sorry for him. He went to him, poured olive oil and wine on his wounds, and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey. He brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins. He gave them to the owner of the inn. Take care of him, he said. When I return I will pay you back for any extra expense you may have. Which of the three do you think was a neighbour to the man who was attacked by robbers? The authority on the law replied, the one who felt sorry for him. Jesus told him, go and do as he did. Amen.
A brief word of prayer before I begin. Let us pray. Lord of life, let your spirit energise our spirits and stir our minds, our hearts and our faith. In the name of Christ. Amen. The passage we heard from Romans is set for today, and as I read Paul's words, they really struck home. He begins with a simple thing, pay what you owe. But then he makes an enormous leap by saying, there is something you can never repay, and that is the love you owe to others. As a practising Jew, he points to a few of the Ten Commandments that will help. But then he goes further, just as Jesus did, by saying that loving your neighbour as yourself is the key. That does everything that God's law requires. And then I remembered that story in Luke's Gospel, where someone wants to know what the limits are, and so asks Jesus, and who is my neighbour? In a world full of boundaries of religion, ethnicity, status, gender and so on, the man's question also implies, and who is not my neighbour? The stock answer was that neighbour was family, locals and stranger in the town. But Jesus goes all topsy-turvy yet again, and as was often the case for ordinary folk listening in, he told a story. Why were Jesus' stories so good? Well, to begin with, he knew about the storyteller's rule of three. Do you remember the parable of the talents? Where two do well and the third fails? Well, this one's the other way round. Two fail and the third succeeds. And then things happen in the story in threes. First two come and see and pass by. The Samaritan went and poured and bandaged, and then he brought and put and took care. And finally, next day, he took and gave and promised. It's a simple storyteller's rhythm, and it works. Jesus' choice of hero is interesting, isn't it? And Luke sets the scene for this story at the end of the previous chapter, where Jesus and his disciples were not made very welcome at a village in Samaria. Listen to this, from chapter 9 and verse 54. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? In fact, Jesus told them off, and they simply went on to another village. You see, the disciples too needed to hear this story of the good Samaritan. The setting would be familiar to everyone. The priest and later the Levite assistant were heading home after their two-week shift at the temple in Jerusalem. The 17-mile journey down to Jericho was exposed and could be dangerous. The body on the road was unclothed, so it could be anybody. Besides, there was blood and possibly death, and that would make them impure if they approached And then it would be back to Jerusalem for a week of purification, no opportunity to collect their tithes, and that would affect their families back home. So the law is very clear. The right thing to do is to pass by. Really? Yes. The temple requires it. The way this story from Jesus will go questions the accepted framework of decision making. So I want to ask you to think about your framework of decision making. For instance, when did you last change your mind about what you think is right? Our world is full of tricky issues. Next year's Methodist Conference will need to decide where our church stands in relation to same-sex relationships. Opinions will differ, but a policy will emerge. Can we live with our church if it makes a decision we disagree with? Hmm. As I write this, 
The High Court is yet to decide about that girl Shamima Begum, who, at the age of 15, joined ISIS, has born and lost three children, and had her British citizenship removed by a former Home Secretary. Is that right? How do we come to a decision about the right thing to do? Here, Jesus did not give an answer, but told a story that revealed his own framework of decision-making in the guise of a hated Samaritan. This story is certainly for us, right now, in our present world. So, back to the story. It has another structure that Jesus' hearers would have been alive to, but we don't easily spot. There are seven scenarios. First, the robbery, the priest, and the Levite. And then our hero Sam appears, who then treats, carries, and spends on the victim. It's pyramid-shaped, with three things leading up to Sam's arrival, and three outcomes following it. The focus, the pinnacle, is scenario four, Sam's act of love. That's the central point. The Samaritans were not like that and liked at all. So Sam, as a good guy, is like a Wild West story of the good Indian. Or, if you want a current theme, maybe think of that iconic picture of the black man carrying an injured white man away from the Black Lives Matter demonstration that had turned violent. In Jesus' story, Sam steps up to the occasion by giving first aid, with oil that cleans and wine that disinfects. Putting the victim on his donkey would slow him down and put him at more risk. But Sam's framework of decision-making has kicked in, and he can do no less. In that knife attack at London Borough Market, whilst others ran away, a nurse ran to help and then was stabbed to death herself. With COVID-19, many NHS staff, knowing themselves to be at risk, nonetheless walked into that danger day after day. If you're a fan of Michael McIntyre. You will know that often, just as the audience is beginning to recover, there'll be another comment on the same joke that sends them into yet another paroxysm of laughter. That is exactly what Jesus does here, except that it's not funny. Blow after blow strikes at the common assumptions way over the top of the limits of credibility, and well beyond for some. Just try to hear it with the ears of the disciples and others around who disliked Samaritans so much. Having taken care, Sam takes the victim to an inn. Oh, for goodness sake! Pays for a week. What? And then offers to pay even more. He's taken leave of his senses and given a blank cheque. The reality is that Sam has used all his resources, physical, financial and time. His framework of decision-making is ready to give his whole self. No wonder, then, that the early fathers, Aragon, Ambrose and Augustine, saw Sam as an allegory of Jesus. Now, back to the questioner, who originally asked, who is my neighbour? At the end of the story, it turns out that Jesus, a bit like a politician, has answered a slightly different question that, put briefly, might be, who turned out to be neighbourly? It's a simple, almost multiple-choice question. Was it A, the priest, B, the Levite, or C, Sam? 
note that the lawyer can't bring himself to spit it out. He refuses to hear himself say the Samaritan, but says rather weakly the one who felt sorry for him. But finally, he does get Jesus' answer to his question. Go and do as he did. And that is Jesus' answer for us too. This story may have been told for the first time all those years ago, but we are challenged to hear it in the context of our own world today and the issues around us. This story and other parables give us a window into Jesus' own view of the world. Through them, we are called to live against the grain, to embrace a different vision, to see a different realm of living with a different framework of decision-making. Jesus called it the kingdom of God, not rules-driven, but vision-driven. A vision is a kind of picture of what it might be like, and what better than a story like this to convey that? With Sam as our role model, we can become followers of our Lord in our own world, but filled with his vision. We have already, and will continue, to make our own stories, make up the picture of our own identity. They might even become parables for others. Who are we, really?
intercession are taken from some of the prayers issued by the Joint Public Issues Team over the past week or so. Let us pray. Lord, we pray for low income families. Around 80% report to be worse off financially, and this has taken a toll on the health and well being of those worst affected. We pray for your provision and for compassionate, radical policy making to eradicate poverty. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. This morning we give thanks for teachers. Schools in Scotland have already returned and pupils in England and Wales have either gone back to school this week or will do so in the coming days. As teachers adapt classrooms to keep students safe, we thank you for their care and support and pray for their protection this school year. We pray for every child returning to education, especially those going to school for the first time and those changing schools. Lord, we pray for the mental well-being of all children, that none will feel anxious or afraid about their schooling. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for postal workers. They've been on the front lines delivering our mail and keeping us connected, yet they are underpaid and many are on precarious contracts. We pray for their protection and for policy making that seeks to confront these issues. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for migrants living in the UK. As many lost their incomes, thousands with no recourse to public funds have been denied help during the pandemic. Lord, we pray for your provision and for policy reform that ensures they have access to the support they need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for low income countries. The World Bank has stated that COVID-19 has pushed many of them from recession to depression. We pray for an ambitious debt relief plan and cooperation between countries to prevent a deeper debt crisis. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining us for worship this morning. Just to let you know of some of the things that are going on within our four churches during the week, that at various times we have fellowship groups and prayer groups that you are very welcome to join. And on a Sunday morning at 10 o'clock on Zoom, we have family church for all our children. And at seven o'clock on a Sunday evening, new youth for our teens. And now, as we cannot physically make our offering to God, we do so in a different way. Let us pray. Help us to be generous givers, dear Lord, both of our money and our lives, that we might make a difference in the places where we live. We ask this through your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, who gave all that he was, that we might know life in all its fullness. Amen.
thank you to all those who made this service possible. And we conclude with a prayer of blessing. Go now, not to serve yourself, but to serve others. Not to seek your glory, but the glory of God the Father. And so may all you are and do make God known. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all for evermore. Amen. Thank you.